Okay, so we're, we're going to start the seminar today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ECOM seminar today. My name is Ivan Ortega, and we have a special time for our seminar today because we have a special speaker joining from the UK. It is my pleasure to introduce Fiona O'Connor. Fiona is an atmospheric composition scientist working at the Met Office Hadley Center. Uh, she started her career by doing a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's in environmental chemistry at the National University of Ireland. Then uh, Fiona completed, completed her PhD in atmospheric dynamics and Rossby waves at the University of Wales before moving to the University of Cambridge to work on atmospheric composition modeling. Uh, she joined the Met Office Hadley Center in 2004 to work on the development of a UK community atmospheric composition model called UKCA. UKCA is now a component of the UK's Earth System model, UKESM, and has contributed to several international assessments. Fiona recently led the UK ESM contribution to the Relative Forcing Model Intercomparison Project and the Aerosol and Chemistry Model Intercomparison Project. She is now a work package lead on a new European project on earth system modeling development and is co-leading a working group on tropospheric ozone relative forcing as part of the tropospheric ozone assessment report. Uh, okay, today we are using a Slido uh, to, to post questions, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. If you are not familiar with the Slido, you can scroll down the web page of the presentations where you are right now, and you can see the slide interface uh, at the bottom of the web page. Questions will be passed to Fiona at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Fiona. Uh, welcome, and please take it away. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, good morning to you all um, uh, in mountain time. Um, it's it's 5 p.m. here uh, in British summer time. Uh, and like, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to present some work to you that I've been do involved with on investigating the role of Earth system processes in the present day forcing of climate. Um, I'd also like to thank Ivan for, for the invitation uh, and for the introduction and uh, thank himself and Brett for for, for testing the, the IT and, and so on, um, both on Friday and, and earlier today. So much of the motivation um, behind the work that I'm doing um, is really to try and address some of the shortcomings in the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, in particular, uh, the forcings in the fifth assessment were often inconsistent in terms of their approach or in the metric of use um, across both forcing agents and across multiple models. So really we want to try and better characterize the changes in the Earth's radiative budget since the pre-industrial time. Um, and I'm going to take advantage of um, uh, two model into comparison projects or, or MIPS, um, which wanted to address the present day forcing of, of climate climate. And also part of the motivation as well is that if we can improve our understanding of, of forcing, that at least is one step towards a, an improved understanding of, of climate response and indeed uh, the climate impacts to, to, to climate change. So I will first of all give a, a brief overview of the, the UK models that contributed to the sixth coupled model into comparison project. Um, we uh, contributed via a physical climate model or a general circulation model, which we called HADGEM3, GC3.1. And then we also contributed through a, an Earth system model called UKESM1. I'll define the metric of choice that I'm going to use here for, for climate forcing, namely the effective radiative forcing. I'll define it, uh, I'll explain how we calculate it, and then um, I'll, I'll show how I've used both AirChem MIP and RF MIP experiments uh, to look at present day forcing. 
I'll give an overview of the effect of radio to four things that we've calculated with the UK's Earth System model. And then I'll, for the bulk of my talk, I'll, I'll focus on the role of Earth System processes. And in particular, I, I will look at um, um, a, uh, a number of halocarbons, uh, the ozone depleting substances, and I'll look at, at methane. And then I'll draw some conclusions and, and give you an indication of, of some of my future work. So this schematic on the right here is, is showing um, uh, the components in the UK's Earth System model. And you'll notice that they're, they're coloured either, either blue or, or green. So first of all, if we consider the, the blue components, uh, you'll notice uh, the atmosphere. We have a land surface model called JOULES. Um, we have a sea ice model and, and we're using uh, the French ocean model NEMO. Um, included as well in the physical model, which is represented by these blue boxes, is a is some part of the UKCA model, uh, namely the the aerosol component. Um, so all of those things together are considered part of our physical climate model, which we call HGM3 GC3.1. The additional green. Um, boxes or, or parts of boxes are, are then the additional earth system co components which we have added to that physical model. So namely, um, bicycles is the, is the land ice sheet model, Medusa is the ocean biogeochemistry, and the green portion of this UKCA box is, is atmospheric chemistry. And you'll see that UKCA as a whole is coupled to the land surface, both for interactive uh, land emissions, but also deposition. Uh, you'll see that it's it's coupled to the atmosphere. Um, that's partly because we use the atmosphere um, to do our, our tracer transport, be it large scale advection, um, convective transport and boundary layer mixing. Um, plus, of course, we're using the radiation scheme in, in the atmosphere model. Uh, and also UKCA is coupled to the ocean biogeochemistry in, in terms of um, marine emissions, uh, both primary marine organic aerosol, but also um, marine dimethyl sulfide emissions, um, which act as a, as a precursor. So the Earth System model itself is fully described in this paper that was published in 2019 by Alistair Seller. And then the chemistry and the aerosol parts of, of UKESM one are, are described in these two GMD papers published last year. So I'm going to use the effective radiative forcing as the metric of choice here for, for climate forcing. And this is represented by this cartoon on, on the right hand side. So we diagnose it by using by looking at the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes and it um, and the and it incorporates an instantaneous radiative forcing, but it also includes uh, adjustments, um, be it on the land or in the atmosphere, that can also influence the, the radiative fluxes. Um, it's fairly easy to diagnose in, in, global climate, in global climate models because it's using standard top of the atmosphere radiative fluxes. And it's also more representative of the eventual temperature response um, than the, the traditional metric for radiative forcing, which is represented here in the middle, which we call the stratospherically adjusted radiative forcing. So the difference between these two metrics is that with the stratospherically adjusted radiative forcing, you're only including a, a single adjustment, namely uh, a temperature adjustment in the stratosphere. Whereas with the effective radiative forcing, you're including adjustments in the troposphere, in temperature and humidity, uh, you're including cloud adjustments, and there may even be uh, land surface temperature and or surface albedo responses. And we refer to these as, as, as adjustments. So as I mentioned, uh, this is calculated fairly straightforwardly um, with model simulations. Um, so we run typically uh, two simulations. One acts as a control experiment. Uh, one acts as a perturbation experiment in which we apply some kind of perturbation relative to the control. So it might be a change in a greenhouse gas concentration. It might be a change in land use, or it might be ch a change in a, an aerosol uh, emission. 
So we run both of these simulations um, for 30 years or so. Uh, they share the same sea surface temperatures and sea ice. So there's no uh, temperature response or adjustment over, over the oceans. Um, we diagnose the difference in the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes between those two simulations. And the effective radiative forcing is the time mean, area weighted mean of those differences. So I mentioned at the outset that I'm going to make use of simulations that were conducted um, by the UK models for both the radiative forcing model into comparison project and the aerosol and, and chemistry MIP. So both of these model into comparison projects wanted to evaluate the present day climate forcing from uh, anthropogenic forcing agents. They wanted to use the effective radiative forcing as their metric of choice. And they also agreed on the protocol that they wanted to use in order to calculate those forcings. So the experiments that were conducted under RFMIP focused on quite high level um, forcers like the total greenhouse gas forcing or the total aerosol forcing, whereas uh, the aerosol and chemistry model into comparison project wanted to look more at the speciation of, of the forcings. Uh, so in terms of aerosol, it was interested in SO2, black carbon and organic carbon. And in the case of the reactive gases, it was interested in methane, nitrous oxide, the ozone depleting substances. Um, and so the experiments in both model into comparison projects are really quite complementary. So I'm going to take advantage of, of that um, here. So this slide shows a, a first look at the main categories of forcing agents assessed with the UK's Earth System model. Um, so in the, in the bottom left, the table, I'm showing the, the total greenhouse gas forcing, the total aerosol forcing, and then the forcing from land use, um, non-methane tropospheric ozone pre precursors, and then the total anthropogenic forcing. And you can see that the ERFs at the present day um, are, are roughly within the broad range of estimates from the IPCC fifth assessment report. So here, although I'm quoting standard errors, you'll notice that they're very small. And this is really just a measure of the variability um, in, in the ERF. So it doesn't fully capture the uncertainty in, in the forcing. The full uncertainty is more represented here in, in, in the top plot um, from the IPCC fifth assessment report for, for aerosols greenhouse gases and, and total anthropogenic forcing. Uh, and this larger uncertainty really reflects the representation in models, um, uh, uncertainties in emissions, uh, in the case of the aerosols, uncertainty in the pre-industrial state and, and so on. And you'll also notice that I've included here the uncertainties in the aerosol forcing from a, a more recent assessment led by, by Nicola Bellowin, published in, in 2019. OK, so we can take then a, a, a first look at the, at the global distribution of, of these forcings. Um, so here I'm showing the, the greenhouse gas forcing in the top left, aerosol top right, land use bottom right, and, and the non-methane ozone precursors in the bottom left. The stippling here is showing areas of the globe where the, uh, the ERF itself is, is not robust at the 95% uh, confidence level. Um, and the percentages here are, are showing the areas of the globe where I, I do get um, a, a robust signal. So in the case of the greenhouse gases, um, we're getting a, a robust signal over 93% over of, of the globe. Um, you'll see, for example, it's, it's showing in the southern high latitudes. Uh, sorry, uh, it's showing an, a negative forcing. Um, potentially due to ozone depletion, uh, which is outweighing the, the positive greenhouse gas forcing it's, itself. You will see in the case of the aerosols forcing um, that there are regions of the globe where aerosol absorption is outweighing uh, the forcing due to, to scattering. 
And you'll see in the case of the ozone precursors that actually uh, there's very few areas of the globe in which we're seeing a, a robust signal, only of the order of, of 10%. And that's true of, of land use, although you'll see over some continental regions um, that the signal from the land use forcing is, is very concentrated. If we look then at the total anthropogenic forcing, uh, and again, the stippling here is, is showing regions really where we can detect a, a robust signal given, given the variability. Um, you'll see that, that there are some continental regions where both the aerosol and the land use forcing combined dominate over, over the greenhouse gas forcing. So first of all, let's look at the total greenhouse gas effective radiative forcing from both HGEM3, GC3.1 and the UK's Earth System model. So in red, I'm here I'm, I'm showing uh, the UK ESM1 estimate uh, and in blue, I'm showing uh, that from GC3.1. And you'll see that I've broken the effective radiative forcing down into clear sky components and the cloud radiative effect both in the in the short and, and the long wave. So you'll see first of all looking at the, the net effective radiative forcing that the, um, the forcings are quite comparable between the two models. However, if you look at the clear sky contributions both in the short and the long wave, you'll see that the long wave component in the clear sky is more positive uh, in the Earth system model than in the physical model. And you'll see that the, the clear sky shortwave component is less positive in the Earth system model than in the physical model. And indeed, there's a, a reversal of, of sign here. So what's causing these differences and are they important for, for present day estimates of, of climate forcing? So in order to answer that question, I'll use some additional experiments and analysis. I'll take advantage of the linearity of greenhouse gas forcing to try and identify and, and quantify the, the role of Earth system processes. And in particular, I'll focus on both ozone depleting substances in the first instance. And then secondly, I'll focus on, on methane. So firstly, let's demonstrate the linearity of, of the greenhouse gas forcing, first of all. So again, along the top, uh, I'm showing the components of the effective radiative forcing from all greenhouse gases from the, the UK's Earth System model. And then in the, in the subsequent rows, I'm showing the individual components to the effective radiative forcing from CO2, from methane, from nitrous oxide, and from this group of halocarbons uh, known as the ozone depleting substances. And in fact, if we look at the individual components uh, in the short and the long wave, um, in the clear sky and, and the cloud radiative effect, we can see that actually the individual greenhouse gas components add linearly. So it means that we can use these individual greenhouse gas paired experiments for example, for methane or for the ozone depleting substances to look at the role or the potential role of earth system processes and how they might contribute to the differences in the total greenhouse gas effective rate of forcing that we previously saw between the physical model and the earth system model. So let's consider the effective radiative forcing from ozone depleting substances. So this figure I've taken from a paper that was published earlier this year by, by Gillian Thornhill. And you'll see over on the far right, she's uh, plotting estimates of the effective radiative forcing from ozone depleting substances um, from six models that contributed to the aerosol and chemistry model into comparison project. Um, over on the far right, she's showing the, the multi-model mean uh, and the range of uncertainty in, in, in that mean. So first of all, you can clearly see uh, there's quite a, a large spread of uncertainty in the effective radiative forcing. And there's even uncertainty as to the sign of the forcing. And this is potentially contrary to views that controlling ozone depleting substances through the Montreal Protocol and, and its amendments has had a, a net benefit to, to climate. So without any observational constraint, the uncertainty in the effective radiative forcing of ozone depleting substances is quite large um, with uncertainty as well as in relation to the, to the sign of the forcing.
So this work that I was involved with, with, with Olav Morgenstern, tried to address this lack of an observational constraint. So again, it's using um, five models that contributed to AirChem MIP, and it, has, it found uh, that the, the range of estimates in the effective radiative forcing from these models was linear, uh, was linear related to the modeled ozone trend in those same models coupled historical simulations. So it means we can use this linear relationship and we can use observations of the historical ozone trend to infer an observationally constrained estimate for the effective radiative forcing. So, we, uh, so the green here is representing the observations and the uncertainty in the observations. And then we can derive uh, an observationally constrained estimate for the, for the ERF. So we find that the ERF um, using this emergent constraint lies in the range between minus 0 0.05 and, and plus 0 0.13 watts per square meter. So the range is slightly reduced from the Thornhill et al. assessment uh, and the multimodal mean is still positive um, but lower in magnitude. Um, but we, we have at least reduced the spread of, of the uncertainty. We can also use this linear relationship and we can infer what, um, what the effective radiative forcing from a physical model might be in the absence of any representation of atmospheric chemistry. So we take this zero ozone trend line and we can infer what a physical model might estimate for the effective radiative forcing of ozone depleting substances. And in this particular case, we find the ERF is 0.43 watts per square meter. So these are greenhouse gases. So we'd expect the bulk of this uh, effective radiative forcing uh, to be in the clear sky long wave. And indeed that estimate of 0.43 watts per square meter matches the clear sky long wave component um, from the UK's Earth System model. However, you'll also see that that clear sky long wave component is completely balanced out by a negative uh, clear sky short wave component, which we believe is, is due to ozone depletion. It's very strongly negative, and you'll see that the UK model is showing the strongest ozone depletion of, of the other participating models. And so the remaining effective radiative forcing in the UK model is really reflecting uh, changes in, in the cloud radiative effect. So the question is, what is the cloud radiative effect like in, in the other participating models? Do other models suggest that there is an additional contribution to the effective radiative forcing from uh, a negative change in, in the cloud radiative effect? So this next, so this table here again is taken from this paper by Gillian Thornhill published earlier this year, and here she's broken down the effective radiative forcing into the instantaneous radiative forcing from aerosol radiation interactions, uh, a clear sky aerosol free contribution, and then a cloud radiative effect. So you'll see that each of the models that she analysed are indicating that there is a negative contribution to the effective radiative forcing from this cloud radiative effect. So it appears that the, the, uh, the behavior of the UK's Earth System model is, is, is also apparent in, in other models. These plots here on the left are showing the global distribution of, of that cloud radiative effect in, in, in the short and, and the long wave. And you'll see that it's very much dominated um, by changes in, in the southern high latitudes. So although the, the Morgenstern et al. paper, and indeed the paper I published on all anthropogenic forcings from UK ESM, mention this cloud adjustment, we don't actually provide any, any explanation or a, a process-based explanation of, of what's driving that cloud adjustment. So in, in UK ESM1, we found that ozone depletion is driving an intensification and a polar shift in the polar jet. And that gives rise to changes in interactive sources of, of aerosols and aerosol precursors. And that the cloud adjustment that we're seeing evidenced here in the Thornhill et al. paper is actually aerosol mediated. 
So although this hasn't been explored in, in other models, um, it's quite possible that other models contributing to Air Chem MIP, which include interactive chemistry and have interactive marine emissions of aerosols or aerosol precursors, may also be seeing the same mechanism um, at play. So that might be something to, to look at uh, in the future. So now let's turn our attention to, to methane. So again, this is the same plot that uh, we've seen before, but now I'd like you to, to focus over on, on the left-hand side where Gillian is, is showing the estimates of the effective rate to forcing from, from methane, from all the models that contributed um, to AirChem MIP for, for the methane experiment. So the deeper orange here represents uh, the UK's Earth System model, uh, and the gray here represents uh, CESM2 Wacom. And you'll see on the far right here, we're showing the, the multi-model mean and, and uh, standard deviation. So of all the models that contributed to AirChem MIP, uh, the UK's model is, is showing the largest forcing um, for methane. Um, so we're going to investigate that a, a little further. So here, uh, again, I'm showing in the table uh, a breakdown of the effective rate to forcing into, into its components. So as we might expect, the, the bulk of the forcing is in the clear sky long wave, but we see an additional positive contribution in, in the short wave. Uh, and in fact, UK ESM1 is the first time we've represented short wave absorption by, by methane. But you'll see that we're also seeing a, a positive cloud radiative effect, where the positive cloud radiative effect in the short wave outweighs the, the negative cloud radiative effect in, in, in the long wave. Uh, and the plots here are showing the global distributions of, of each of those com components. So, of course, we know with methane, it's a reactive greenhouse gas. Um, so we're not only going to, <clears throat> excuse me, so we're not only going to get a direct radiative effect from, from methane itself, but we're also going to get um, some, um, uh, some contributions from methane-driven changes in, in ozone, for example, or in water vapor, or, or indeed potentially uh, in aerosols. So what contribution to this total methane effective rate to forcing of 0.97 watts per square meter from UK ESM1 is direct from methane and how much is due to indirect effects or earth system interactions? So the plots here are, are showing multi-annual zonal mean distributions of ozone, water vapor and Aitken mode number concentration and accumulation mode number concentration. And the plots on the right are, are showing changes as a result of the pre-industrial to present day perturbation in methane that has been applied in these simulations. You can clearly see this tropospheric ozone production uh, and, and, and destruction occurring aloft. You'll see that methane is acting as a source of stratospheric water vapor. But you'll also see that there has been, a, appears to be a, a change in, in the size distribution of the aerosol with fewer, smaller particles. The bottom plots are showing aerosol optical depth. And although there are regional changes here in the aerosol opti optical depth, on a global annual mean basis, uh, the changes in aerosol optical depth are, are near zero. So what contribution to this total methane ERF is, is directly due to, to methane and how much is it due to, to changes in ozone or water vapor and, and so on? And this is what I'll address in, in my next slide. So we've run additional pairs of experiments with UK ESM1 uh, to try and apportion the total methane effective radiative forcing uh, to different forcers or to different interactions that are, are active in, in the model. So the first column here is where um, I take the, the UK's Earth System model and I sequentially disable a single interaction or a single forcing agent from affecting the, the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes. So I, as I disable aerosol cloud interactions, aerosol radiation interactions, ozone and stratospheric water vapour, 
I try and, um, and in the end, it's only methane alone through its direct radiative effect and its adjustments can, can impact the, the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes. If you like, this acts as a kind of surrogate for what a, a physical model um, might represent as the, as the methane effect of radiative forcing. You'll clearly see that there appears to be a, a positive contribution to the methane effective radiative forcing from aerosol cloud interactions. Again, as you might expect, there's positive contributions from, from changes in ozone and, and water vapour. So the, 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 error, the standard errors here are, are fairly large, and this is because I'm inferring the contribution from, say, uh, aerosol radiation interactions by differencing two, two pairs of simulations. So in the second column, I've taken a more direct approach and I've run a single pair of experiments where only a single interaction or a single uh, atmospheric constituent is allowed to um, affect the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes. So if you like, this gives me a more direct estimate of the individual contributions. So the errors here are, are much smaller because I've removed the, um, the differencing between successive pairs. Having said that, you'll see that actually both approaches um, give me similar results to, to within the errors. Uh, you'll notice that when I add up the individual contributions, um, the sum replicates what I previously had. And you'll also see that methane alone uh, contributes about 50% of the forcing and that the Earth system interactions are substantially increasing the effective radiative forcing from, from methane. So how do these individual contributions to the methane effective radiative forcing can, um, compare with, with other air chem MIP models? So again, from Thornhill et al, um, she's broken the, the methane effective radiative forcing into different components. So the uh, instantaneous radiative forcing from aerosol radiation interactions, the clear sky aerosol free forcing, and then the cloud radiative effect. And you'll see here that actually the UK's Earth system model is the only model that has a positive contribution from the cloud radiative effect. All of the other models have, have a negative contribution from the cloud radiative effect. So it appears as if this positive cloud radiative effect in, in the UK model uh, may well explain why we have the, the largest forcing from, from methane than, than the other models. We, we know from the Thornhill et al. assessment that the ozone and stratospheric water vapour contributions from the UK model are consistent with other air chem MIP models, but that, that the positive cloud adjustment is, is not consistent. However, it's unclear from the Thornhill et al. analysis whether those cloud adjustments are dynamically driven or whether they're aerosol mediated. And so these additional paired experiments that I've, I've done with UK ESM1 allow us to investigate the processes that are driving uh, the positive cloud adjustment in, in the UK model. So let's focus on, on two pairs of simulations. Um, so the only difference between these two pairs is that in one pair, aerosol cloud interactions are, are active um, and in the other pair, they're disabled um, with a prescribed um, cloud droplet number concentration. So you'll see that the individual components in the, in the clear sky match between both pairs. You'll see that the cloud radiative effect in the, in the long wave is also consistent, but you'll see that the magnitude of the cloud radiative effect in, in the short wave doubles with the inclusion of the aerosol cloud interactions. So when we take the net cloud radiative effect, uh, it means uh, that we get a positive cloud radiative effect when aerosol cloud interactions are included. But as soon as we disable them, we get a switch of sign. And this switch in sign would make the cloud radiative effect, or at least the sign of that cloud radiative effect, consistent with the other models. So the question is, why are we, why is aerosol cloud interactions having this impact in, in the UK model? So I've done a complete secondary aerosol budget analysis. Um, and here I'm showing the results from uh, sulfate aerosol. Uh, 
Uh, so this schematic is showing, uh, is representing how uh, sulfate aerosol is, is formed in the pre-industrial atmosphere. And then uh, we then um, implement a, a perturbation of, uh, of methane concentration in this pre-industrial atmosphere and the oxidant contribute the oxidant distributions uh, change within the troposphere so what this does is that it alters the relative contributions of the different oxidation pathways of of so2 so we still end up oxidizing the same amount of so2 when we add a methane perturbation, but the relative contributions of the different pathway changes. In particular, we reduce the amount of SO2 that we oxidize in the gas phase because of the impact methane has on, on the hydroxyl radical, but that reduction is, is compensated by an increase in the amount of SO2 that's oxidized in, in the aqueous phase. However, because this gas phase uh, oxidation pathway reduces in, in its contribution, it means we get less sulfuric acid in the gas phase um, available for both condensation and, and indeed for nucleation. And that gives rise to a, a shift in the aerosol size distribution because we get fewer nucleation events. So we get fewer uh, aerosol particles in, in, in the lower sized modes um, and, and a shift in the mass towards, towards the larger particles. The plots along the bottom then are just showing the multi-annual zonal mean differences um, in the different oxidation pathways that arise due to the, the methane perturbation. So what does this impact of, of the methane perturbation and, and, the, and the oxidation pathways uh, do in terms of aerosol and, and cloud? We'll have seen from an earlier slide um, the reduction in, in aerosol number in both the Aitken and, and accumulation mode. Um, we can calculate uh, N50. So this is an estimate of the number of particles that are, are large enough to, to activate cloud. And you'll see that there's a near global uh, reduction in N50. And the stippling here now is, is showing the regions of the globe where, where that uh, change is, is significant at the 95% at the confidence level. You can see also that we're seeing a, a reduction in, in cloud top cloud droplet number concentration and you can see in in the marine stratocumulus regions we're seeing a reduction in, in total cloud fraction so it appears at least in the uk model that there's little evidence that the positive cloud adjustment is is dynamically driven um, it appears to be predominantly aerosol driven um, where the reduction in cloud droplet number concentration is, is making the, the shortwave cloud radiative effect generally more positive. So to conclude, in looking at the total greenhouse gas effect of radiative forcing, although the estimates in the net radiative in the net effective radiative forcing between the physical model and the UK's Earth system model appear to be comparable, on closer examination, the inclusion of Earth system processes contributed to substantial differences. So, for example, there are differences in forcing due to indirect effects. Um, in particular in the representation of chemistry, and we've known about indirect effects for, for some time. However, we're also seeing differences due to aerosol-mediated cloud adjustments. So in the case of the ozone-depleting substances, uh, these aerosol-mediated cloud adjustments were due to changes in, in aerosol and aerosol precursor emissions. And in fact, there appeared to be little sensitivity to, to changes in, in tropospheric oxidants. However, in the case of, of methane, uh, there was no change in interactive sources of, of aerosols or aerosol precursors, um, and the aerosol-mediated cloud adjustment was, was predominantly driven by, by oxidants. However, in the case of the ODSs, it appears that the cloud adjustment in the UK's Earth System model is consistent with other air chem MIP models, whereas that isn't the case uh, in the case of, of methane.
Although I didn't show anything here on CO2 forcing, we also see that there are differences in, um, in the CO2 forcing between the physical model and, and the Earth system model. Part of that is due to the inclusion of a physiological forcing in, in the Earth system model. That's the response of vegetation to increased atmospheric CO2. But we, but we also see, saw differences in, in the albedo effect be between the two models. And this is related to differences in vegetation cover, where in the physical model, model vegetation is prescribed, whereas in the Earth system model, it's, it's modeled dynamically. So I hope by showing you these examples, I, I've clearly demonstrated the importance of Earth system interactions when, when quantifying effective radiative forcings. And also, um, these in, in the case of Earth system model simulations that are quantifying effective radiative forcings, these rapid adjustments are including uh, both chemical and, and physical adjustments. So although these chemical adjustments are important and we should take account of them, you'll see that actually on, on picking and understanding the effective radiative forcing, once you're including and considering both physical and chemical adjustments, is actually quite, quite complex. So Ivan said at the outset that I led the UK ESM1 contribution to both the radiative forcing MIP and the aerosol and, and chemistry MIP. And really that wouldn't have been possible and much of the work and analysis that I've presented here wouldn't have been possible without the contribution of all of those listed there. Um, many of them were involved in setting up experiments, running, reviewing them, um, data processing, uh, analysis and uh, and, and contributions to, to papers. So I, I very much wanted to thank each, each of them. Uh, and also I'd like to thank the Earth System Core Group for actually building the UK's Earth System model on, which underpinned much of the analysis um, that I showed today. So in terms of future work, I just wanted to show, uh, give you an indication of two elements that I'm hoping to work on over, over the next year. Um, so the first is that uh, we have funding through a new, a new EU project called ESM 2025, which we've just kicked off this month, um, in which a number of European Earth System models um, are going to be developing methane emissions capability. So all the all the, uh, the runs that I presented here were using methane as a prescribed concentration, um, whereas here we're, we're aiming to, to try and, and run with, with methane emissions rather than concentrations. And to give you a, a first look, uh, it appears when we run a four times CO2 experiment with our methane emissions Earth system model, uh, it appears that our, our climate sensitivity is, is even higher than what we previously found with the, with the concentration driven model. So my some of my future work will be on picking this and, and trying to understand um, what, um, what's driving these changes. Is it a change in the CO2 forcing or is it a change in, in, in the feedbacks? The second part that I'm doing um, will be part of the, the contribution I hope to make to the tropospheric ozone assessment report. And in particular, I'm hoping to attribute um, the ozone forcing to, to different drivers um, over the historical period and, and building on work that, that Ragnhild Ski um, started and contributed to, to CMIP6. So thank you very much for, for listening uh, and thank you very much again for the opportunity to present some, some of this work. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. A lot of work going on here. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, you can ask them now or by typing in the Slido interface. Uh, so far, I don't see questions. Probably, I wanted to ask about future work, but I guess you just mentioned your, your future work. Um, uh, I don't see questions. Mm, probably it's morning here. Everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> In part. fact, I find myself I find myself here sitting in my um, a dark room. It suddenly got dark here um, as I as oh, I was speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't see questions yet. Uh, and just a reminder: so this we this seminar will be posted in our YouTube channel. So I am pretty sure. 
normally we see a lot of viewers in our YouTube and so sometimes they ask you afterwards. So we will see. I don't see questions. Uh, sometimes this is kind of delayed. Uh, well, I'm more than happy, Ivan, if um, there are questions uh, later on, I'm, I'm more than happy um, to answer those by, by email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't see questions, probably. Everything was very clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So there is a lot of a lot of work going on in this, and I was just wondering about like the future international collaborations that are happening because I'm not doing any of this. So, but you just mentioned the you just mentioned the uh, the two projects right there. Yeah, are there interna are those international assessment uh, collaboration, or is only from the UK model? No, no. Um, so in, in, in the aerosol and chemistry model into comparison project and indeed in the radio to forcing one as, as well, um, um, I mentioned, well, I showed on my slide, there were two papers that described what those model into comparison projects were, were aiming to achieve and set out the sort of experimental design. Um, so a number of multiple models con contributed to, to those. Um, if I go well, back, for example... Um, to so here, for example, um, from this paper by Gillian Thornhill, um, which was funded through this EU project Crescendo, um, you'll see that actually there was a range of of models. Um, the CESM two Wacom model is is in there. You'll see the UK model is in there, but there's others from from France, from the US, um, was, and so on. I was. I'm sorry, I was just more, more wondering in the in the slide of your future work. So you mentioned ah, two projects. Okay. The two projects you mentioned were the ozone and the what was the other one? The methane. The methane. The methane. Um, so yes, sorry, Mivan, I, I misunderstood your question. So in the in the case of this methane emissions capability, um, we've we've already developed um, some of this capability in the UK model, um, but through this new um, EU uh, European Union funded project called ESM 2025, and that project is is only starting this month. Um, there will be a number of European Earth System models that will be aiming to develop methane emissions capability. So then as part of that project, we will be collaborating um, both in terms of model development, but also multi-model evaluation. And again, looking at aspects like climate sensitivity, um, uh, responses uh, over the historical period and, and so on. And in particular, looking at the role methane might play in, in future mitigation of, of climate. So that does involve collaboration, at least um, uh, with other European models. In terms of this, his yeah, in terms of this historical ozone forcing, um, this is using uh, simulations that were conducted as part of the sixth coupled model into comparison project. Um, and um, so effectively this would be making use of a, of a number of models, both the US, European um, and, and Japanese models that have run simulations over the historical period. Um, and in particular, uh, within AirChem MIP, I'll be using simulations that are run over the historical period, but have one particular driver fixed at pre-industrial levels. So I'll be making use of those to, to then look um, at the role each of those drivers um, has played in historical ozone forcing. Um, so there, there is an opportunity for me to and others to, to collaborate on, on that. Okay, yeah, thank you. There is a question from Rebecca Buchholz. And she said, thanks Fiona for a great talk. Can you talk more about, about how you will implement methane emissions? So I'm not really sure what you mean like uh, by how. Um, 
So, for example, we have a very simple um, wetland scheme uh, in the Earth System model, and indeed it was included in, in UK ESM1, albeit the emissions weren't, weren't used. Um, so basically it, it uses sub, sub-grid scale heterogeneity in, in uh, in topography uh, to try and diagnose a, a fraction of each grid box that might be inundated. Um, and then it uses um, CO2 as a, as a, a surrogate for um, the sort of available substrate that might decompose um, when inundated um, to produce um, methane. So we have interactive methane emissions. Uh, we're working on, on um interactive methane emissions from um, a fire model. And then we will use those interactive emission sources with prescribed emissions um, from other natural sources that we can't model interactively, um, like termites. Um, but we'll combine those with, with also anthropogenic emissions. Um, so as I said, we, we have we have done this initially, um, albeit not including the interactive fire emissions yet, but but prescribing the fire emissions. Um, so I'm not sure, Rebecca, if that fully answers your your question. Um, so within ESM within ESM 2025, other modeling groups will also be looking at implementing permafrost processes with a view to to maybe diagnosing um, uh, methane emissions from from permafrost thaw, um, and other groups will also be looking at at lake emissions. Okay, I'm pretty sure Rebecca can email you or ask you. At, uh, Yes, I'm, I'm more than happy if, if, <laughs> if Rebecca wants to email. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't see more questions for now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess with that, I guess I would like to thank you, Fiona. I really appreciate it. You, you accepted the invitation and it was a nice seminar. And Thank you. Again, we will we will upload the seminar in our YouTube channel. It will be very nice there. Uh, thanks everyone for joining, and see you in a couple of weeks for another seminar. Thank, Thank you. Fiona. See you everyone.